Hello and welcome everyone to an hour with the experts. My name is Brent Garvin, Senior Product Manager for Imaging for Plan Mecca USA, and I welcome you. A um, few housekeeping items before we get started um, with the uh, today's lecture is we have um, to disclose that I am an employee of Plan Mecca. However, the panelists that are joining us today are non-paid and are not receiving any sort of compensation whatsoever. They are here on their own free will and they're here to share their expert opinion on this topic uh, through an educational format. I also wanna draw your attention to the bottom of your screen. There is a Q&A and a chat section. We will reserve the Q&A portion uh, for the end of the lecture. We will come in live and answer uh, the questions that you provide during the uh, lecture. And the Q&A section is where we would like those questions to be. The chat section, let's reserve that for any technical questions you may have. Um, just so you know, there is no video of us on the screen at this time and will not be until uh, we start with the lecture itself. Um, so be prepared that you will not see any video of any um, of the panelists until uh, they're brought in for the questions part. But let's reserve the chat section for anything technical. And once again, Q&A, please address your questions there. And at the end of the conclusion of this uh, lecture, which should last about 50 minutes, uh, we'll reserve a lot of time for, for question and answers. Um, CEs will be provided at the conclusion of this course. You will receive a link uh, to uh, send in your request for CEs and you'll receive a course code as well. And then as far as future educational webinars, we invite you to visit planmeca.com, that's P-L-A-N-M-E-C-A.com. And you will see um, on the home screen currently, we have all of our webinars that we have available to you. They are typically an hour lecture and they are free of charge. And we hope you visit and, and, and see what we have to offer in the world of education. So today's agenda, Today's agenda, we are going to give you an understanding and an update to the COVID-19 ADA guidelines. Um, we're gonna give you an understanding and how you can comply with these guidelines. And we hope that you will learn something today from industry experts on their personal experience regarding the new ADA COVID-19 guidelines. So if you're not familiar with the guidelines, let me simply just review that you can obtain the ADA guidance during the COVID-19 crisis. It's the back to work action plan uh, from the ADA and what they recommend that you do. And I wanna draw attention to about six points that um, I would highlight um, on the many recommendations that they've provided. Please know that these recommendations are constantly updating. Uh, given the circumstances. Um, so as of this morning, uh, things had changed in some of the states. Um, some of the, um, the things regarding surfaces and all of that, as I understand it, uh, within the last hour or so, um, there have been some updates to it as well. But as of um, yesterday, there are about six things I wanted to draw your attention to. First of all, COVID-19, as they understand it through the CDC, is what they described as a stickier virus than the previous COVID or other viruses. So obviously that means infection is easier um, than what you would uh, usually classify any sort of virus um, that you may have come in contact with. The uh, COVID-19 does survive on surfaces for various times, just like any other virus or bacteria. Uh, obviously metal and plastic surfaces react differently. Um, the temperatures, um, the environment itself, all affect the survival um, length uh, and life cycle of the COVID virus. As far as screening for dental emergencies, they're asking dental professionals to utilize what they describe as tele-dentistry, which is uh, remote capabilities that could be in the form of uh, a phone interview. Um, it could be in the form of um, let's say uh, patients in the parking lot and you're asking questions 
um, or a personal experience I have uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan here a couple years ago, um, the ER department at the local hospital, uh, Spectrum Health implemented a, uh, an application, which is very WebMD um, type of an interface where patients could disclose some of their symptoms to the ER doctors and they could define whether there was a critical need for the patient to uh, uh, visit the ER immediately or if they could be directed elsewhere. So those are sort of the things that they're describing as newer ways um, to help you transition back into the workforce. And then as far as members of your dental team, even um, um, those that work within the practice that come in contact with patients or at the front desk, they ask that they remain six feet away. Um, obviously from treatment uh, area, areas, they prefer a six foot um, distance of the aerosol spray area and they prefer that you limit your um, operatory um, areas with the patients to just the operator of the equipment and possibly an assistant to assist. So those are some of the big highlights that I wanted to highlight. And then the last two are ones that really draw the attention to the purpose of today's lecture, and that is the spread of aerosols uh, produced by the equipment that is in the, um, the dental operatory or those uh, types of equipment that are used for the patient, such as uh, hand pieces, scalers, syringes, it indicates. And they're concerned obviously with um, patients coughing and um, that unfortunately leads us to the topic of intraoral radiographs and um, the impact that those could have with the patient and um, anyone in the operatory with the patient. And then the last highlight, which really caught everyone's attention, was taking extra oral radiographs whenever possible. Intraoral techniques may induce coughing, they have found. And so the preferred method moving forward during this time is to look at uh, modalities such as extra oral imaging. And that's what we're excited to talk about today to give you some help in that area. So today, we have three fantastic guests. Um, given the conditions of uh, today's environment that's constantly changing, um, good news, bad news, a um, couple of our clinicians have been asked to report back to work for either emergency purposes or to go return back to normal um, um, of seeing of patients. So unfortunately, they are unable to join us today. Um, however, we ran this uh, lecture yesterday and recorded it. We had some technical difficulties that we got through based upon uh, connections and all of that, but the recording was fantastic. And so we are going to play that recording uh, in just a moment from its entirety. And then, of course, in order to follow the guidelines of CE online, we are going to then pause that video at the uh, conclusion and we will bring in live um, the panelists that are available today, as well as myself, to answer any questions that we have um, posted in the Q&A section. Remember in the Q&A section, uh, please post your question if you could kindly just look through it and make sure the question hadn't already been asked. And for the most part, most of the questions we will get to throughout the lecture, but anything outstanding at the end, we will either recap or um, um, address uh, separately. So joining us today, via recording, um, possibly live if she um, finishes up with her patients, is Kristen Hartung with uh, Spring Dental Group in Racine, Wisconsin, a hygienist for many years with a lot of experience, and she's been dealing with this. We're excited to hear from her, as well as Dr. Matthew Lenz. He is a general practitioner uh, with Lenz Associates just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, I think you will appreciate some of the things he has implemented in his practice that he can help you with. And then obviously to not overshadow anybody on this panel, um, and he is definitely here today live with us to answer Q and A's at the end um, because of the hot topic of radiation and x-rays and COVID, we ha have the pleasure of being joined with um, the head of radiology at the University of Minnesota, board certified radiologist, in fact, the president of the American Academy of Oral Maxofacial Radiology Association, 
Dr. Mansoor Ahmad, and he is a tremendous asset. So please bring your questions so that we can provide you with some wonderful information today. So um, obviously this whole new world, these whole new guidelines um, have brought to us um, things that we may not have seen before. Obviously the ADA is asking us to get comfortable with that change. And what does that change look like? Well, in the world of imaging, it's a, a leaning heavily more towards extra oral imaging, whether that's a panoramic, a cephalometric, uh, a, a 2D extra oral PA, or an extra oral bite wing, for example, or a 3D image. They're asking you to, to rely on that uh, first and foremost. And that obviously is change. That might be something that you're maybe not totally comfortable with relying on on a routine basis. So we're here to help you through that process. Um, you might um, not have been taught that in dental school, so maybe this is something that's out of your comfort level. Um, and change isn't easy. So our guest panelists here today are here to help you, and that's what this whole thing is about, is helping the wonderful community of dental um, with this change. So with that said, Dr. Ahmad, the first question that we have for you um, is, if you could help us understand why the ADA in the first place has made this drastic re recommendation in the first place when it comes to extra oral imaging, that would be fantastic. So the primary reason for such a change is lack of interaction in the patient's mouth. So if you are using a full mouth series of radiographs, Obviously you are spending about 15 minutes or 20 minutes working on a patient's mouth. And it can be avoided by taking a panoramic radiograph or maybe an extra oral bite wing and the exposure to the patient's mouth would be uh, about a half a minute, maybe even less. So your chance of exposure to patient's uh, uh, saliva or anything is much lower. It makes you much safer. The examination is faster. And overall, the patient's waiting time in the clinic is even less. So there's a lot of time saving. And the diagnosis these days are probably as good as extra oral, uh, intraoral radiography with a full mouth series. So that's a good move. Maybe it will be the new normal. Uh, currently, probably it's only for COVID. But as we see the benefit, maybe it may become the new normal in the future. Right, right. Well, that would be exciting to, to, to learn more about. And we can talk about that more in detail. Um, not to shift gears to away from extra oral imaging, but, but Kristen, um, how about you? I mean, you're going back to work. You and I spoke and, and you said that this is kind of like a dry run is going on and getting your feet wet back into what this looks like. Um, what's going on with you? What's, what's so, it look like from your point of view? So we will, we will have a soft open this week, uh, two providers at a time. So only two patients in the office at any one given time. There will be no interpatient contact. The patients will be ushered to and from the rooms, from their cars through the front door. They're, they will wash their hands before we get started and then we will do everything within the treatment rooms and so they can just bypass the front desk before they they leave the office and straight out the door okay and then dr lenz did you say that you were heading back to work you shared with me last week and all that what's that look like what's going on in your world today yeah um you know we've been seeing emergencies for the past uh month uh, four to five weeks um about you know, anywhere from eight to 10 patients a day, three times a week. So it's been uh, pretty consistent. Um, and our workflow is totally different. Um, we have patients waiting in their car. We call them when we're ready for them. They come in. We have a, an entryway that is blocked off from the rest of the office. We take their, um, we take their temperatures at that point. And prior to them coming into the office, we've created a Google document that they fill out prior to their appointment, about 24 hours prior to their appointment, ask doing the whole COVID screening. They'll fill that out. We'll get that electronically, take their temperature. If everything checks out, then we allow them in the office at that point. Um, we try to triage, we've been trying to triage their 
um, problem over the phone. So as they come into the office before they're even in the um, operatory, we may take a 2D uh, bite wing or Panorex prior to me seeing them after diagnosing, kind of triaging them over the phone to see what the issue is, pain, things like that. Um, and then we'll put them in the room and I can do the full examination with the x-ray there with the patient just for uh, keeping the patient, keeping the um, appointment consistent, efficient. Uh, I'm able to diagnose a lot prior to even seeing the patient. So it's been very, very good for the workflow, keeping my patient or keeping my staff safe and uh, away from the patients as long as they possibly can. Um, so again, it's, it's been, it's been a great asset to have and have in the practice. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we're going to do a soft opening next week also. Um, and my, uh, my staff is, is ready to go. So we'll be using the extra oral imaging, um, exclusively. Okay. We won't be using sensors anymore. Right. Right. Well, besides x-rays, I mean, what, what's, tell us something, you know, that's going on in your world that many don't know about. I mean, you're dealing with you know, staff that, you know, are used to seeing patients all the time to now cold turkey, no patients in the, at the practice. I mean, besides imaging, what, what's, go, what's been like a big thing that's, that you've learned from this? Well, um, it's, uh, what I've learned is uh, my staff really does like what they do and they're really ready to come back to work as we all are, I'm sure. Um, but as far as what we've learned, we've just, um, they're really, we don't know what we've learned yet until right. we get really get back to work, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting. I'm sure, you know, this soft opening is going to expose a lot of things that maybe we should be doing differently. Um, and the guidelines keep changing every week. So it's really hard to kind of keep up with this stuff. But my job as, uh, their boss and their leader was to be able to procure all the proper PPE for them. So they feel safe coming back to work. Right. Um, and I'd be lying if I wasn't a little bit nerv nervous when I first started seeing patients after this all happened. But after a couple of days, you start feeling comfortable and you kind of get in the groove of changing gowns, changing masks, changing gloves, you know, more than you're, more than you're used to doing. Um, so the, uh, the workflow is much, much different than it used to be. Any um, flashbacks but it, you know, to de dental school? What's that? Yeah. A lot of flashbacks to dental school. <laughs> I haven't worn a get surgical gown in a long time, but I don't know if I'll ever go back to be honest with you. Right. Um, you know, but, uh, it's, it's definitely a different feeling. Um, I don't like calling it the new norm. I call it the current norm because I, I think eventually we'll transition back to something that we're used to. But right now, this is just the current norm. Um, you know, once we get a vaccination for this, I think things are going to still be different, but we'll be able to be a little more lenient on the PPE, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So speaking of uh, the flashbacks to, to dental school, um, being at the dental school, Dr. Ahmad, what, what's going on at the, at the schools right now? I know it's probably maybe summertime or close to it um, for you so, guys, so. So it started somewhere during our spring break. So we got pushed away by three weeks and the students just completed their exam uh, last week. The problem was that we had to give them an exam that they can take it home, but still have to be secure. So we used a system called exam software and it has got a system where it will flag if anything abnormal happening, like someone is looking at a book or something. So those will be flagged. So the students are under stress because it's a new thing. The faculties are stressed because we have to develop lectures online, which we had never done. So last one month I spent learning Premiere Pro, Adobe Premiere Pro, uh, editing all my videos, which I had never done. <laughs> and so teaching is different. Uh, uh, but we are making sure that the students still get the best education possible. So the viewer who are listening to us and uh, in future when you are going to recruit a new dentist, uh, 
be comfortable. We are producing good dentists. We are still giving the best education possible. The clinical uh, scenario would be slightly different, but they are still getting the best education as much as possible. It's different, and as Dr. Lance just mentioned, we'll probably be back to normal uh, pretty soon whenever the vaccine is out. But this is a time that it's a, it's a challenge. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys sharing like your personal stories and what's going on in your life. Um, to the topic of um, the COVID reg regulation, or I should say recommendations from the ADA on extra oral imaging, um, either of you two or Dr. Ahmad want to share your personal experience, what you're doing in the office that maybe you didn't do before, you're doing now, maybe you're doing more of your the spotlight shined on some sort of thing. I mean, you've mentioned extra oral imaging, doctor. Um, what's going on in your world in regards to that? What, what, what does that look like? They come in and take an extra oral bite wing, yeah, you so, mentioned? So what we'll be doing more and more, our clinic starts from uh, tomorrow, more uh, patients. So we'll be moving away from full mouth series and to uh, panoramic, extra oral panoramic bite wing and just panoramic. Um, as a school, we have a requirement that we have to still teach the students how to take a full mouth series. So that can be probably done on a skull. We have already done on the skull, but maybe more, or maybe we can wait a little bit. But for diagnosis of the patients right now, we are going with <coughs> panoramic radiography and then some CBCT and cutting down on the requirement of intraoral imaging. Okay. And then Kristen, from your vantage point as a hygienist, um, anything changing? You're doing more of, less of? So we've been doing extra oral bite wings since 2013. Um, we went all in when we decided to get the machine. And um, in the beginning, I'll tell you, you know, there's challenges and even just logistics that you have to work through. Having one machine in the office and three hygienists, we thought they were crazy to start this. Um, but really, we, are, we manage patient flow very well. Um, we've changed a few systems to allow us to have um, just one person in that room at a time. Um, but we get a bigger image from external bite wings. We, you know, you don't miss the distal of a second molar. You don't miss a third molar. You don't take an intraoral bite wing and then wish you had it vertical. Um, there's a whole kinds of reasons why this is much better and why it has been our normal for so long. Um, you just get way more information on the first take than having to go back, retake, you cone cut, the patient moved their head once you walked out of the room. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, you know, it's, it reminds me of like on the medical side, because uh, we're a healthcare company and so on the medical side, you know, they, they often say in the medical world, you get one shot right? So we got to make it count, right? So we got to delicately balance um, diagnostic information, the need for it, as well as radiation levels, but they sometimes get one shot to, to be right. So it um, sounds like that, that addresses that. How about you, Dr. Lanz? What's, what's your practice look like yesterday, today, moving forward okay. with extra oral imaging? Well, um, it's interesting, Kristen, you were saying that you've been doing it since 2013, and I did an office remodel back in 2013 and got an instrumentarium pan that um, took extra oral bite wings. My hygienist fell in love with it. Absolutely loved it. Well, then, we, then I, I uh, merged another practice in with my uh, practice, big implant company or big implant practice. The doctor had an eye cap, so I got sold my pan and brought the iCAD in so we could be doing more uh, implant surgeries, um, which was great for that. My hygienist for a year and a half gave me so much flack for not being able to do extra oral imaging. So got rid of the iCAD, bought the Plain Mecca Mid. It's been, they absolutely love the machine. It's been fantastic getting back to extra oral. And we've been doing that again for about a year and a half. So we were out of the extra oral imaging for about a year and a half. And we really, really did miss it. Um, it interrupted the workflow of the entire office. Um, like Kristen was saying, it just keeps everybody 
you get one, you get one shot and you get everything that you need to get and you can find pathology on these uh, extra oral bite wings very quickly and you can take an isolated CBCT um, on that pathology and able to diagnose so much more deni- uh, so much more pathology um, and give more definitive treatment planning after uh, after that so it's been fantastic I could never go back I never will go back um, we still do use a sensor every once in a while, but we're, you know, 95% extra oral imaging at this point. You know, Dr. Mott had mentioned um, that, you know, in this, in the teaching environment, of course, all different modalities have to be respected and have to be taught um, at higher ed uh, because you never know where they're going after, right? And what access they have to technology once they leave that environment. But are, like, as far as 3D, Dr. Lenz, you're, is it safe to say you're doing most of your imaging extra orally? So for 3D, rather than let's say a full mouth series, you take like a pan, you take a 3D image. What does that look like to you? Um, absolutely. Um, we take a ton of CBCTs. Um, it, we're a big implant practice also. So that's, that's the reason why we do have that. But um, as far as doing, um, you know, fine endodontic lesions and things like that, it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, uh, so yes, we're doing a lot of pans and doing a lot of extra oral bite wings. And also if we find pathology or patients coming in, uh, with pain, we'll, we will do a CBCT. Okay. Okay. Isolated the amount, or full. The I'm amount sorry. of unintended dentistry that you do find because your image is so much greater um, has been remarkable. And it goes from endo to even down to pedo. You find missing teeth at a much younger age. You can get them over to the ortho office faster. Um, the number of kids that we get much better images on because they're not trying to fudge with that sensor in their mouth. It's a game changer. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, Dr. Ahmad had mentioned um, extra imaging. That's a, a broad term, right? There's um, panoramics, obviously CEPHs, uh, some machines do 2D periapicals on them because uh, they can isolate down to a single tooth that way. Uh, extra oral bite wings, CBCT. I mean, all the above, obviously, anything that's taken extra oral is extra oral. Um, so let's break down those, those, those three. So panoramic, bite wing, and 3D imaging. So obviously panoramics, most dentists today have a panoramic in their office. Um, maybe they're going to lean on it a little bit more like you were saying, Dr. Lenz, that you're going to probably do things, you know, heavily more uh, towards this, even though you, you have implemented it. Um, but when it comes to pans, I mean, manufacturers are doing what they can. And, and Dr. Ahmad's probably seen a lot of different uh, machines out there. But obviously, I'm thinking patient or staff education is big, right? So most dentists right now are probably gearing up on education, doing a lot of Zoom webinars with their staff, maybe getting some, you know, virtual training on taking pans. Um, because obviously a, a good tube head, a good sensor is important for good image quality. Patient positioning is important. So some machines have layering effects. So they have different layers um, that they can look at throughout the panoramic versus just one image, one focal trough. Um, some do uh, autofocus capabilities where it's kind of like your iPhone. It just takes the pan, right? The staff just hold the button down and it figures out where to take the pan. So manufacturers are really doing what they can from our standpoint to address consistency, image quality that may have not been in the past. Um, Bite wings. You both are doing it. Dr. Um, Ahmad, uh, sounds like you implemented that at, at the university level as well. Um, obviously using them on a routine basis. Um, the, when it comes to extra oral imaging, I'll, I'll be honest with you, that's probably one of those areas where if the machine has it, they try it. Maybe they don't continue using it. Um, what's been some of the biggest challenges of implementing extra oral bite wings? I mean, Dr. Um, Ahmad at the university level, you guys, this sounds like you're teaching at there. Was there a big learning curve for everybody there? Yeah, there is a learning curve. We still teach more of intraoral biting just because of the requirement from ADA and the educational requirement. 
So we teach the students how to place a sensor inside the patient's mouth. Okay. It's a skill, it's very difficult. Uh, so we teach them intraoral radiography more than we teach them extraoral biting. We teach them panoramic positioning very well. Panoramic uh, positioning is very difficult. Interpretation of panoramic radiograph is also very difficult. It's probably more difficult than any other imaging, chest imaging, brain imaging, whatever you say. Panoramic is probably the most difficult because there are so much superimposition. Uh, so we teach a lot of interpretation on panoramic radiography. Uh, but what we have to remember and what Brent just mentioned, the new technology, the panoramic from 10 years ago was very different. What we have now with the new technology and Brent uh, briefly mentioned about the selecting the layers. These are wonderful technologies that we could not even imagine. Uh, so pen of today is not the pen of 10 years ago. And that's the reason I hear from Dr. Lance and Kristen that you are all for the new imaging technique because you are seeing things that we could not see when we were dental students. That's right. What, even what, even just from a patient perspective, um, patient acceptance, uh, for years you have patients that you know will decline x-rays, I don't want x-rays, I don't want x-rays. When you show them, listen, we're not going to put that sensor in your mouth. We're not going to make you gig. We're not going to make you cough. We're going to take this externally. You just kind of need to stand still and stand there. Um, the number of patients who refused x-rays for years in our practice now let us take routine bite wings every single year. Mm -hmm. So when you, when, okay, let's say it's, it's, it's Monday and I'm a hygienist. I'm going back to work and I'm trying to follow these recommendations to the best of my ability. Um, as a hygiene, what kind of pushback do you normally see? Like from, like, like, it sounds like your colleagues were on board and all of that. Maybe they weren't at, maybe there was a, a learning curve. What was that experience like? What? So there definitely, I agree with Dr. Ahmad, there is a learning curve. Taking an external bite wing is, is different. It's not like taking a pan. It's not like taking a regular bite wing. It takes some time to get these perfected to the point that, you know, you're predictable at getting one that's extremely readable. Um, so it does take some time. So you do have to have some patience. But um, as a staff, we just jumped all in and we have been using it consistently. I would say we have very, very little patient pushback at all anymore. I, I personally don't have an x-ray head in my hygiene room anymore. Um, two of the other hygienists do, but I do not. We still do take some intraoral bite wings, but they are pretty few and far between. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah. uh, when, it, when it comes to you know, that, that frustration, let's call it, where someone tries it, they don't like it, right? Um, the pushback so to speak. Um, what, what have been some things for you, Dr. Lanz, that you can share with everyone regarding this? If they're going to go back to work and they're now going to try to do this, has there been things that you struggled with at the beginning um, that you had to get over as far as like reading the, the image, the interpretation of it? Uh, no, actually not at all. Um, Dr. Ahmad was saying the pan of today is different than the pan of 10 years ago, you can probably agree that the Panorex was probably one of the worst diagnostic images that you could take in radiology, right? And nowadays, they're, uh, they're incredible um, on what you can detect on these images now. Um, as far as pushback from my staff, is that what you're asking me? Well, the, the, as far as pushback from the industry itself, right? I mean, most look at pans um, and they say, or they look at, let's say, a bite wing, for example, mm -hmm. and the pushback they usually get is, is, well, it's a fuzzy out of focus image. It's not as sharp and crisp as my 17 line pair sensor that I have. I mean, those are the things that, that we hear from a manufacturer standpoint of, of, of the balance between image quality and diagnostic image quality. So I was just curious if you... When you first started, did you have to, did you take a course? Did you contact a radiologist and say, hey, what am I seeing here? I'm not used to this view. Um, no, I didn't. Um, if there was anything questionable that I, that 
I was thinking, all right, is that decay? Is that an approximate decay on these on these new bite wings? As my staff got better and better at taking them, now they're they're perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, but I would take an intraoral um, bite wing just to confirm if I was seeing something there or if I wasn't seeing it there, just to confirm. I wouldn't charge the patient anything. I would just say, hey, I just need a different angle on this. As my staff was getting used to um, taking these and getting better and better at them. Now um, it's just, it's, it's very easy for them to take these images. Um, patient acceptance, like Kristen was saying, is unbelievable. Gaggers, people with tori, it's just much more comfortable experience. Pediatric patients, the kids are very, very easy. I mean, sometimes they'll move around, they'll wiggle around a little bit, but um, all in all, you can, uh, you can make it a very comfortable patient experience. And I think that also is helpful for the hygienists uh, and staff because uh, they're not having to, to fight the patient or even hurt the patient with the sensors. So, so this, uh, this course is obviously an hour with the experts. And obviously, I just picked two of the best experts in the industry because they read x-rays just fine and the interpretation's fine. But I know Dr. Ahmad, that's probably not status quo, uh, safe to say. Scan interpretation is something you take seriously. What, what has been some of the, the, the critics out there regarding imaging? Because as I mentioned, that's something you hear a lot of is it just doesn't look as great as my intraoral. So I don't know if I want to use it. I mean, did you run into that? So uh, the critic was me. I, I did a study a few years ago and published in JADA about the benefits of extraoral and intraoral bite wings. And uh, the study was proposed by a student, a resident. He's a periodontist now, and his name is Micah Chen. So Dr. Chen came to me asking to do this research, comparing extraoral and intraoral bite wings. And I said, you don't have to do it because extraoral bite wings don't work. And so that was my opinion. And I said, let's do it. I said, yeah, you can do a study. It's a good and negative study is not bad at all. And you have to show again that extraoral bite wings uh, are not usable. So I started with this negative mind that extraoral will not work. We have to stay with intraoral bite wing. And I said, okay, if the data says something different, but that's good. So we did this study. We had uh, pulled a team. We had two uh, board certified radiologists. We had a general dentist. We had a uh, resident and we had a radiology faculty who was not board certified. So we looked at about 110 or 115 patients. We took intraoral bite wings, we took extraoral bite wings, and then we sat, we blinded, we read all these images, not knowing which one is which. Surprisingly, the extraoral bite wings did wonderful for both caries diagnosis as well as crystal bone loss. Uh, they are pretty good. What we got is, uh, uh, slightly false positive, higher false positive with extraoral bite wing. False positive means that it's telling me that there is caries, but it's not there. So what we did, we compared it with intraoral bite wing as the gold standard. What we should have done in an ideal research situation that we have to take the tooth out and look at it clinically. But that would not be possible in a patient situation. If it was a clinic uh, lab situation, obviously we can take the tooth out and look at the caries. Uh, this was a patient situation. So we took intraoral radiograph as the gold standard and the extraoral radiograph as the test. So extraoral actually picked up more caries. So we call this as false positive. Um, is it really false positive or is the intraoral taking, uh, detecting less caries? We don't know that. Uh, that so uh, what we see, uh, even if there's false positive, you are not going to do a restoration today. You can wait on these lesions. And if you wait a few months, the caries will be probably a little bigger. You may be able to see clinically or with an intraoral radiograph, um, and the patient is not harmed. So if you wait a few months, 
uh, the lesion may become slightly bigger, but probably will not end up with a pulpal exposure. So we are not in the advising that patient should be harmed and waiting and then getting into pulpal exposure. If you suspect that it may be wrong, you can wait a few weeks, a few months, and take another image, make sure that yes, this is the right thing, the, or the right, uh, correct lesion. So I, I mentioned the word pushback a couple times, and, and um, obviously it's, it's one of those things like, well, I'm not, I don't understand necessarily the pushback because there's no pushback in our personal practices. I would say when it comes to the research, validating the science behind how you feel, you guys are spot on. I mean, when it comes to the, the research that I've seen out there, and I've done a lot of research on extraoral imaging, uh, five major studies from four major universities, two from the University of Texas, um, UNC did an extensive uh, study as well. Um, your alma mater, I think, Dr. Um, uh, UConn just published yes, one, they did. I think about six months ago. And in your study, I think you said 100, 100 and some patients. Is that what yes, you? Yes. Okay. And 120 I, or 115 st uh, students, uh, patient, uh, subjects. Yeah. Well, you know, two, two points to, to, to focus on here for the audience is one, the false positive. Thank you for clarifying that because most that when they read something and they see the word false positive, they think of a negative word associated with a result, but that's not necessarily true. Um, but going back to, you know, the number of patients and the number of readers that you had read those scans, I've seen studies that have been done in, you know, countries, you know, all over the world that have done studies on extra oral imaging, but they might have, you know, two raters, they might be non-qualified raters of the study, they might not do it on patients, they do it on dry skulls. So the environment is controlled. So I got to applaud you that obviously the University of Minnesota stepped up the game and, you know, obviously had to do something pretty significant to get approval to do studies like that. Yes. So uh, because there was uh, studies earlier done on skull, so we decided that we have to move it to the patients. Mm -hmm. And before we read all these images, we made sure that we are reading the same thing. So we looked at 20 uh, interoral bite twins, 20 extraoral bite twins, and then we rated those. So that was our standardizing that we all are reading the same thing and we are reading at 90% confidence interval. So okay. once we were in the same uh, level of diagnosis, then we read this 116 uh, subjects. Again, mixed them up and we read them. We all agreed that whatever we are seeing, is what we are seeing. If we did not agree, we went back and we say, okay, what was wrong? So um, there are five readers, uh, all five readers, we agreed on the diagnosis. So we are very comfortable with the numbers. I thought that the result will come out that yes, extra imaging did not work because that was my, uh, my pushback from my, inside me. And I was surprised how the results came out. Uh, other studies, uh, not using Tanmeca, uh, people have shown similar results. Uh, they used a different technology. Tanmeca uses a technology called SCARA. Uh, Brent probably can explain the full form. I, I don't recall what SCARA stands for, but it's a uh, patented technology from Tanmeca. Other companies use something similar, but the results are pretty similar between different brands. Yeah, the, so SCARA is selectively compliant articulated robotic arm. That's what's used in the automotive industry to manufacture vehicles. I'm in, I'm in Motown, uh, two hours away from it right now in Michigan. And so that's what's used in the automotive industry to paint cars, to manufacture them, because a, a robot can be instructed to do whatever it needs to do without any limitations on the movements. So it's certainly not a patented technology. SCARA is not patented. What's, what what might be referred to is it how it's applied from a, a, a dental standpoint. So Plan Mecca has a patent on the use of SCARA technology in the dental industry. Um, so hopefully that kind of clarifies what that what that means. But it's just allowing the machine to go into different position points because as, as you mentioned, there's no more studies that need to be done to prove 
that the Porsche can break 100 miles an hour, right? So consumers report doesn't test how fast the car goes. They'll report how fast it goes from zero to 60, but they don't have to worry about that. They just want to now talk about how it handles. So I think the studies have all exhausted themselves that it is superior. Um, so now it comes down to the routine use of it, the robotics, whether it can open up contacts consistently or better than intraoral. Because sadly, when it comes to caries detection, and I'll, I'll go back to the all due respect to my hygiene friends, you know, that, that's their world they live in, right? You want the school to focus on caries. The doctor want to school for the whole oral cavity. So um, two different, you know, mindsets going on right there. Not that the dentist doesn't care about cavities, but they're looking at gross anatomy, the entire, entire head. So yeah, I mean, sadly, the modality that's out there is at an accuracy rate of 45%. So if Dr. Ahmad's study can bring us to the same or better than that, I think that's a pretty cool paradigm shift, you know? So let, let's, let's shift gears to, to 3D imaging. So Dr. Lenz, you, um, you're using 3D imaging in your practice. Kristen, do you have mm -hmm. 3D in your practice? No, I believe the machine's been ordered, but it hasn't come yet, so. Oh, okay, all right, cool. So, so, so Dr. Lanz, you, um, let, let's, talk about, let's talk about 3D imaging. Obviously, there's concerns about that, and, and Dr. Ahmad can t help us you know, clarify some of these sort of obstacles when it comes to 3D imaging. Um, but obviously, it's great you know, applications. It has its purpose and all that, but concerns would be, you know, taking images at radiation levels that may exceed intraoral, uh, scan interpretation might be something that might be concerned. Tell us about your practice and what you're doing with your 3D. Well, with the, um, I'm ensuring, I'm not, I'm not taking full mouth CBCTs on every single patient. Um, I'm using it as, on a case-to-case -case basis. The, the, with the plain mecca, the radiation is extremely low. Um, unless you're doing a high, uh, high definition CBCT, you're going to be exposing the patient more, which I only really use on endodontic cases, to be honest with you, um, to detect um, detect uh, the canals or canals that you could potentially miss um, or fractured teeth. It's it's been an amazing uh, adjunct to. Uh, my practice having that capability. Um, as far as interpretation, I've taken multiple courses on CBCT interpretation. A mentor, a good friend of mine, Dr. Randy Resnick, he's the um, director of the MISH Institute, which I was a um, part-time staff there. I'm a diplomat in the ICOI. So I've taken a lot of courses on CBCT interpretation, and I feel confident at what I'm looking at, and if I, you know, if I need to refer it to uh, a specialist, I have that ability to know what's abnormal. Also, unnecessarily know exactly what, um, you know, what the abnormal point. But um, whether I need to um, refer to ENT or oral surgeon, I, I certainly feel confident in reading these. So I think it's very important for anybody that's considering having these this technology in their office to take the proper education on how to read them um because it can open you up to some liability issues if you're gonna get this technology in your office and you don't really know what you're looking at yeah um so i know, I know, been, I know what you mean on that because i i had the um luxury of of working with the michigan dental association because michigan was the last state um to be regulated by the government, right? So in order for someone mm -hmm. to even have access to 3D, um, they had to go to the state of Michigan for permission. It was called certificate of need. And I will say that was one of the biggest obstacles um, that the medical radiologists had was scan interpretation. They sure. wanted to know that, you know, dentists took it seriously. They, they took what the peers of the industry, like Dr. Ahmad, are saying about radiation concerns, um, reading scans, and all of that. So, um, speaking of scan interpretation at the university level, are there resources for for doctors to learn how to read scans? So, in our school, we give a CE course uh, twice a year, one and a half day, and we teach 
we basically handhold the doctors uh, teaching them how to interpret. So these are people who have already graduated. We teach our first year students on CBCT anatomy now so that they become more comfortable and then they, uh, as they progress in their curriculum, they learn more about 3D imaging. So what Dr. Lance has mentioned that he does not take uh, CBCT on every patient, that's the right way of doing it. What our academy, I'm president of AAOMR, we recommend that for any implant imaging, you have to take a CBCT scan. A cross-sectional imaging, either a CT or a CBCT, CBCT is preferred because of the lower dose compared to the medical CT. So that's the position of the academy. Mm -hmm. uh, but anytime you are taking a radiation, uh, whether it's peripical or bitewing, there is always a risk. So you have to evaluate the patient carefully. And that's what Dr. Lance says, that he evaluates every patient. And then he recommends whether it's an extraoral bitewing or a panoramic or a CBCT. Each examination has its own role and we have to be a careful clinician. Uh, what you mentioned about Michigan, that's very interesting because Michigan, University of Michigan where ICAT was designed. So that's the first school that made the CBCT technology. And Michigan was one of the last state to allow CBCT to their dental offices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we fought it for years and every three years that they, it came up to bat and the Michigan Dental Association had the opportunity and this last time uh, we got some board certified radiologists to, 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 to assist with that because, I mean, we were talking about dose reductions that were less than medical and all that. And speaking of dose, I, I know that's a, a hot topic. I know that, um, you know, when it comes to the use of comb beam, I fully understand uh, the rules of engagement and the proper use of, of, of comb beam. But I've, I've got to ask, when it comes to paradigm shifts in the industry, we've seen things from fast turnaround sterilizers. Those were a huge paradigm shift. When uh, handpiece sterilizations um, needed to be elevated, we saw paradigm shifts when um, things went from old belt driven hand pieces to air turbines to, to electric hand pieces. Those were uh, paradigm shifts, scaling paradigm shifts for a hygienist. Um, maybe we're now at a paradigm shift for 3D imaging, I, I possibly. If, if, if companies have the ability to drive down that radiation level to be equal to or less than intraoral, maybe there's an opportunity. So I, I know that's a, that's a hot topic and we can save that for another uh, uh, lecture and all that after my, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe I can mention a little bit. Yep. So uh, intraoral radiography with a round cone, uh, that's most of the practitioners still use a round cone. And with a D-speed film, the radiation dose is close to 400 microsievert. Yeah. So let's keep it at around 350 maybe. Okay. 350, 370, something like that. Round cone, D-speed. If you take it with a, a round cone and digital sensors, we're bringing it down to about 70 uh, microsievert. A CBCT scan may be range from 40 microsievert to about 150. So the dose is a little higher. Uh, a panoramic is about 10 to 15. An extraoral biting is about four. Okay, so these are the numbers. Um, we get hung up with the radiation numbers a lot. We have to be careful, no doubt about it. But the thing that we have to remember that it's the diagnosis. And for diagnosis, if you need radiation, uh, go ahead and take it. If you don't need the radiation to make a diagnosis, there is no reason that we should be exposing a patient. So even if there is a larger dose from a CBCT, the 3D information that we get is invaluable. So we may have to take a CBCT even if there is a dose. Compared to a CBCT scan, a chest CT is 7,000 right. microsievert. So we are talking about uh, less than 200 versus 7,000. A head CT is more than 1,000. Uh, but uh, let's keep the doses now and we'll talk about the extra thing a little more. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, we can, we um, would love to have you uh, back on, all, all three of you back for, for that sort of conversation. Um, I, I guess I'll close the, the radiation conversation with um, 
several things that manufacturers are doing is, is trying to address that, right? They're trying to find a delicate balance between image quality um, and, and radiation, right? A layer principle, a lot of principles is, is, are the principles of today for imaging. Um, as, I, as I've told you, I've followed you um, in the past with what you've done. I, obviously, you did a fantastic study that addressed that, um, where you did dosimetry um, tests on 3D machines um, that were large fields of view. And yeah, the radiation levels were high, and there's a balance that you have to deal with of whether you need that scan and how bad you need it. You know, are you doing an implant? Yeah, you might need it. But now if we can get to a more routine basis by driving radiation levels low, that, that would be nice. Um, I know UNC did a, a fantastic study. UNC did a study um, that uh, concluded, you know, very similar results where, yes, high radiations, less than medical, but still at levels that were high. And then once they tried to reduce the radiation, they lost that image quality. Um, I know the University of Michigan teamed up with UNC. They did a, a study very similar on another machine that found those same exact results. So it seems that it's pretty consistent. I will say there happens to be another study that was done at the University of North Carolina that found something really unique, which was uh, a company had the ability to drive down that radiation level significantly, let's say nearly 80%. To low levels and they keep getting lower and we can do it safely maybe extra oral imaging like we said from the very beginning of this call maybe rather than just being a covid response maybe this could be something that we see in offices throughout the united states more often patients coming in and getting an extra oral bite wing apice to apice third molar to lateral mm -hmm. Kristen's practice is going to be implementing 3d it sounds like so maybe her paradigm shift is, is she has access to a 360 degree view of that patient's tooth. So I think COVID is, is, is challenging. I know that you guys, you know, expressed at the beginning that this is personal and you're dealing with things that you never thought you would have as a business owner, right? Trying to figure out, you know, the navigating through the, the bureaucracy at the state level. Uh, trying to figure out, you know, you're worried about your staff going back to work, right? You're the captain of the ship. So we all have lots on our minds right now. And I think this has been a fabulous conversation. I hope the three of you know that I appreciate your time. Um, and maybe we can continue this conversation um, in the upcoming weeks uh, through this hour with the experts. So I just wanna conclude with that, that I appreciate the three of you. If there's any last minute things that you wanna share with the, the group before we turn over the CEs and turn over uh, the Q&A portion of this segment, um, I'll open up the, the floor to say one last goodbye if you'd like to. Yeah, only thing that I'd like to add that if you have a lot of lemon, just make it lemonade. And That's so this is what we have, COVID-19 is here and we'll come out stronger. That's well said, well said. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, Dr. Lenz, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh no, I just wanted to thank you for having me on. I really do appreciate it, it was very enjoyable. Thank you. Good, good. Same here, Brent, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. It was a nice meeting everybody. All right, everyone take care. We're gonna shift over now to um, the, we're gonna hand out the CEs um, at this point. It'll be on your screen. Um, under the uh, Q&A and chat section. And then we're gonna shift gears now and um, answer questions um, from those that are attending this webinar. So let's uh, shift gears to the Q&A portion. Thank you. Hello, Brent. Hello, Dr. You? Ahmad, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, good, good. So we have concluded um, the CE portion of the course on the chat or Q&A section, you should see a link now for the CEs as well as for the code. Um, if you have any issues with that, um, just let us know and we can uh, get that to you separately. Um, now that we've concluded the, uh, the, the CE portion of the, the course, we can start answering some questions that came in. 
We've had a lot of questions um, that we didn't get to last night, Dr. Ahmad, and we have a lot of questions that came in. So I don't know how much time you have to spend with everybody. We can go through these pretty quickly. Yeah, if so this like. is 11 o'clock uh, our time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have another meeting at 12. So if you want, I can stay for an hour. Oh, wonderful. We probably won't need you to stay that long, but uh, I appreciate the, the, the offer. So sure. let's, it looks like we got about 12 or 15 questions. Um, some of them that we didn't get to last night. Um, and then a lot of them that just came in just now. So let me go through these. Now, since we're, we're no longer on CE time, um, because this is certainly not a commercial for any one company. I, we're not here to, to disclose uh, particular products and all of that. But now that the, the CE portion is concluded, um, there is three questions all directed to each of our panelists. Um, I can answer two of them. Um, so they want to know from Dr. Uh, Lanz what type of 3D machine you, he has. Um, he did state that um, that was earlier on in the, um, the lecture. Someone asked the question. He later answered it. And I think he said a, a, a Planmeca Pro Max 3D Mid is, is what he has. Um, Kristen, I believe, answered that as well because um, the question was directed to her, what they use in their, their general practitioner's office. And um, currently a Pro Max uh, S3 panoramic. And it sounds like they're getting either a 3D upgrade because the machine is upgradable to 3D or they are getting a whole new machine possibly, which could be the, the 3D mid. And then the last one, um, ironically, was what you're using at the school because there is a university on here asking yeah. because they're looking for a new machine. And there's not many universities that don't have Plan Mecca. So I'm excited to find out who this school is. So um, let, let so me far, tell you, what do you got? In, in our radiology clinic, we don't have any plan maca unit. We do yeah. not. Ah. Uh, we have a iCAT. Uh, okay. uh, we upgraded the iCAT a few times. And uh, because we are an educational institute, uh, changing a machine model uh, completely from mm -hmm. one uh, type to another, then we have to train all these faculties, all the residents. So we stayed with iCAT. We have an old uh, pen machine which is dying in uh, we thought of buying a new machine, but with COVID-19, the school is tight, so I don't know if we will get a plan maker or something. The pen machines are cheaper, so our CFO is happy that he doesn't have to spend much money. There is a uh, plan maker unit in our floor, uh, not in radiology clinic. So that's the unit that we used for our uh, research. Oh, nice. But we nice. do not have a plan maker in in our radiology clinic. Well, if you say that word one more time, they're gonna think this is a commercial. So that's awesome, unbiased, did a study. Uh, you know, UNC did a study like that. Yeah. They were doing that study on the um, sensor that was in their backyard and their cone beam machine that was in their backyard. And they went down the street and used one of our machines for their 2D and found out that it performed better than the intraoral. So that was one of the studies that was done by the University of North Carolina, it was fantastic. Um, so yeah, um, if there's anybody, any alumni from Minnesota that's listening, anyone that's in the business community of a really large uh, manufacturer that's based out of your area, that can provide any sort of funds for the university so they can get some more imaging products. Yeah, uh, yeah they would, I'm sure idea. Dr. Ahmad would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. Because uh, we don't donate. No, nobody gets anything from Plan Mecca, I'll make that very clear. All the schools that are using it, um, they're, they, they, they pay for Plan Mecca, so, yeah. and we appreciate that, they found value in it. So, um, all right, question number two, um, how do you code for a bite wing? That is easy. Contact your Plan Mecca, local Plan Mecca imaging rep. Um, they will be glad to assist you with the area of coding. Um, there are simple uh, methods to uh, properly code for an extra oral bite wing um, and handle the insurance um, um, obstacles. Um, my family's in the insurance business. I fully understand how the insurance business works and how um, you navigate through that. So, if we can be any of assistance to you, please contact your local Plan Mecca rep and they will have the answers for you. Um, Number three here. Um, oh, that's regarding um, <laughs> you brought up and mentioned about the um, the machine at Michigan when I was talking about the state of Michigan, and you made a comment 
about the University of Michigan regarding the ICAT and the development, which I'm assuming is back to Sharon Brooks days. Yeah, this is yeah, exactly. Brooks, yes. So yeah, ironically, our our state was under regulations. We were deregulated, or we were regulated by um, by the government to not use it. it. Ironically, maybe you know you're you're onto something. The machine that they worked on maybe had radiation levels that were uncomfortable with the state of Michigan, and um, we did a fantastic job of deregulating them. Finally, in twenty well, December of 2017, it was deregulated. So 2018, uh, the floodgates opened and dentists' hands weren't tied behind their backs anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the initial machines, they had much higher dose. Mm -hmm. And now most of the machines have a low, uh, low dose protocols yeah. uh, and smaller field of view. So those are a good benefit for patient safety. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone's going in that direction. I think we we talked about that. That they're they're all every manufacturer is trying to do the best they can to to develop products that that assist with radiation. So don't don't be alarmed if you hear stuff about radiation. Just um, understand that manufacturers are doing the best they can with the the financial resources and and um, uh, intellectual property that they have to to help our industry in the world of radiation. Um, let's see here, rectangle collimator, back to radiation. I mean, every question seems to be non-clinical. It's more for, for your topic, which is great for, for, for uh, your specialty. Rectangled collimator, we, the doctor said, we use it in our practice. It's five times less radiation, question mark. Um, do you want to answer that? Yeah, it's probably not five times. It's, I think it's half. Yeah. So moving from a round cone to rectangular is at least half, if not more. And it could be uh, four or five times, depending on the study. But uh, a definite saving on rectangular collimation. One thing that I would like to warn uh, people who are using a rectangular collimation, that initially a few times you will have uh, some cone cuts because you are learning. And so there may be unnecessary uh, repeat examinations. So that may happen, uh, but radiography is not as difficult as doing a class two uh, restoration on a maxillary molar with indirect vision. So if you can do a class two on the distal of second molar, you can do a uh, rectangular collimation radiography easily. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, let's see here. Um, number four, false positive. That was already addressed. You handled that uh, um, and addressed uh, seeing false positives. So it led to the question as a follow up to false positives. If someone is, a, is, is, is concerned about false positives and getting misinformation from the x ray, um, do we run the risk now of that? second image or what have you. And I, I, I thought about that one because that's, that's a pretty popular question. And you know, it kind of goes back to, I don't know if anyone's ever read the articles published by um, Gordon Christensen. Um, this one is back in, well, it's back in 2010, gold standard film um, against clinical, right? And so he talks about, you know, what you see is not what you get. So you see it on the x-ray, a little decay, not so much. You go inside the tooth and it's, it's already, you know, far gone. And so I don't know if you have any words of wisdom on how a clinician should practice dentistry when they take x-rays. So we do not have an official guideline from our academy of uh, how to deal this. Um, so this is basically not my, um, only my opinion, not uh, as a president of the academy. Uh, the panoramics are making slices and the newer pan machines are making thinner slices than it used to be. So probably we are seeing a thin layer where we see a carious lesion, which we cannot see on a high resolution peripical or a uh, intraoral biting. Uh, still intraoral radiography is uh, better resolution than extraoral. So if we see caries and if we see that it's uh, in the enamel, maybe early part of dentin, and we are doubtful because it might be false positive. Our research didn't go into taking the tooth out and looking at if there is actual lesion. I would suggest that 
we use uh, we wait a few months um, if you are suspecting that it's close to the pulp chamber uh, i would say go ahead and take an intraoral radiograph it's one exposure and then you make sure that okay it's there or not if you think that you can wait a few months let's wait and then proceed with a new radiography a uh, little higher dose uh, one extra radiography um, i think that would be the right way of doing it because our research didn't go into explaining completely of the false positive okay. it's just the limitation of doing a patient study because our irb would not approve that you see this and then you extract the tooth and if you have to extract the tooth, will not have any subjects. Right. You know, in, in, in that, that the, I'm looking through all my research articles that probably are stacked up behind you as well. Um, I uh, was just going through some things. And, and like I said, this is a pretty popular thing. And it all depends. I mean, if, if we're talking about, you know, caries, which your study was talking about, or we're talking about pathology through an abscess. But like to give you an idea, some of the well-known published um, studies on intraoral, you know, sadly put it at 40% accuracy combined with the clinical examination, it took it up yes. to 49. That's not to say that the dentist is bad and they're wrong, right? It's to tell them that nothing's perfect. Yeah, it's not perfect and a lot of tissue has to be destroyed before radiographs can pick it up. Yeah. So if you see caries, uh, uh, probably clinically it's worse. If you see a peripical lesion, probably it's worse in the mouth. Infection, osteomyelitis, uh, probably it's worse. So uh, um, it takes few weeks, even if there is osteomyelitis infection, it takes a few weeks before it shows up on a radiograph. Patient may be symptomatic and we may not be able to pick it up on a radiograph. So that's the limitation and we practice with that limitation. So. Radiography is not the only answer. We have radiography, clinical examination, and in some situation, histopathological examination. We use all three tools to arrive at the best diagnosis. Well, you said the magic word, practice. Yes. Yeah. Just like medical, just like a lawyer, they practice yeah. law. They don't know the answer. Yeah. You do the best you can as a dentist with yes. the tools that you have and the three modalities if you want to call them that that you just described and us as manufacturers are trying to do the best we can to help each of those sections to elevate them the best we can sure. ours happens to be the diagnostic portion of the x-ray the clinical side has left other manufacturers that handle the clinical side inside the mouth um, from that standpoint but yeah that's 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 a fantastic analogy you know I, another analogy that i that i use is you know they Obviously, in the teaching environment, you probably teach Bender and Seltzer, right? You cite that study from the 60s, right? Yeah. And uh, Bender and Seltzer were looking at, um, at, um, at abscesses. And as you know, it had to be 50% demineralized into the cortical bone before that x-ray source could even detect it. And I equate it to like the drywall, right? And if you've yeah. got drywall and that mold hasn't reached 50% into that drywall, I might not see it. So unfortunately, it has to grow to a point where maybe we can't save the tooth anymore. Maybe we have to be reactive versus proactive. So I think all these tools that we're talking about today and COVID's really shining the light on it, um, I think is a good, if there's any positive lemonade out of these lemons, this is the stuff that we see and hear. Um, all right, we got a lot more questions. Um, if we can um, find them here. So. I uh, printed off a couple from last night. Um, Overdiagnosed, we just talked about that was a concern from the false positive. Um, intraoral versus extraoral bite wing dose. I think you hit on that. Already. Yeah, so intraoral bite wing dose, uh, uh, four bite wing. And this is from John Ludlow's uh, study. And he mentioned that it's about five microsievert. And then I reached out to PlanMeca to uh, know what their radiation dose was. And it was 4.4 microsieverts. So it's almost the same, 4.4 and 5. Uh, so basically, radiation dose is not very different between these two technologies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so Dr. Ludlow um, shared with me, as well as he published a study, 
um, that you anyone can Google search and get access to the study. Um, four bite wing series, digital receptor, so a digital sensor, rectangled collimator, five microsieverts for the yes. four series. Yeah. So rectangled collimator, which is what you're teaching in the schools. Yes. I only I only bring that up because rectangle collimation, unfortunately, in the United States or North America is, is seldomly used, sadly, right? Um, so, so when we bump that up, it puts bite wings at about 24 to 26 microsieverts for a bite wing series for a digital sensor, 4.4. I mean, that's ironic. That's totally accurate. 4.4 microsieverts of radiation for, a, uh, let's say a Pimeca Pro Max um, S3 bite wing. Um, that's awesome. All right. So small decay. Um, I think we already addressed that. Um, oh, do you have a? Do we have a video on Promax positioning for bite wings? Your local Plan Mecca rep is there to help. You made an investment in our products. We're there to help you in the dental community. So please contact your Plan Mecca uh, local rep, and they will be more than happy to provide all the resources you need to get the best out of your technology um, to take awesome extra oral bite wings, um, um, like so many offices do. So that is available. Um, number, let's see here. Isn't, isn't a pan bite wing just a pan? So they're referring to the technology. Is it just collimated? What's going on? Is that something you have experience with understanding through the study what we were doing? Yeah, so it's slightly different technology than just a pan. So it's not a cropped pan. That's how it used to look like. Uh, the way the machine moves, it tries to open the interdental context. On a regular pen, one of the limitations is that we have a lot of proximal overlaps. And in the uh, uh, extraoral bite wing, the way the machine works, and this is robotics, so they try to open up the interdental context. So it's not exactly the same panoramic. Uh, what we see better interdental opening we see the crowns, also the roots in the apical regions, a uh, uh, little more information than a standard interval uh, biting. Even if it's a vertical biting, we get a little more area. Mm -hmm. So there are two images, one for the right, one for the left. And unlike interval uh, biting, we also see uh, some lateral incisors. So a little wider view uh, and opening is a little better. So that's the SCARA technology that uh, PlanMeca uses. Some other brand uses different uh, technology, but basically trying to open the interdental context. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that tends to be the, some of the biggest challenges of why you don't see it maybe used routinely as much is because of the limitations of beam angulation, changing the beam angulation to open it up. Um, that question also came through last night. So I had to dig up the archives and go back to some of the older research because they had asked you know where the studies are because i think i had mentioned um unc um texas did a couple studies minnesota obviously did a fantastic one yukon just published one uh, a few months ago uh, in jada and they it basically concluded what you, what your extensive study said and so then i was digging around trying to find other studies there's the study that i've, I've still got to get my hands on on beam angulation that was done on SCARA technology to prove that it was different. I also found this one here. This was published in 2018, and this one was done on a particular manufacturer's machine um, that's pretty popular, and it had some good results. Uh, they actually show the beam angulation, so if you haven't seen this one, doctor, you will, you'll love this one, but they show the different beam angulations that the machine can go through, and what's interesting is is the standard versus the bite wing. The bite wing moved the beam angulation slightly and helped with the contacts. It didn't do a dramatic difference between the two. What I found interesting is, is the ball bearing, which is signifying roundness and trueness of the x-ray, is the bite wing was round, the standard pan was oblong. And I find that interesting. So like the pan mode, was is is not round and true but yet the bite wing was the results were pretty good the sad thing was is the study 
highlighted that the diagnostic sensitivity um, for interproximal caries was found to be low compared to intraoral. So that was published in 2018. So um, then this is another good study. This one showed another company. Let's see here if I can find the company name. Yeah, this is a good one. So this is a popular machine. They had good results. Detections were not statistically significant. So they said statistically insignificant between an extraoral bite wing and intraoral. So you got five major studies, one company, one study from another company that had some good results, and then one study from another company that was published in 2019. Um, this was 2017, this other one here, um, 2016 as well. Um, so those are some really good studies. If you need help on studies, we can get those to you um, in the audience I'm talking to and help you with that or contact your plan MECA rep and they can certainly um, make sure you have all the uh, information that you need. Um, let's see here, videos on Promax, okay. Isn't it just a pan? Yeah, so back to the pan thing, beam angulation, yeah, robotics, right? We've got to follow the cantonary shape of the dental arch, right? Square jaw patient, V-shaped, normal arch. We want to follow that cantonary shape. I live in Michigan. I'm two hours away from Motor City. And when I walked into their factories and I see an assembly line of vehicles, they use something called SCARA. And it's a robot. And that robot moves around and puts parts on the machine, on the assembly line. When it comes to painting, it gets into areas where things can't paint. And so robotics allows it to freely move. So the advantage to SCARA technology is when it comes to dental imaging, it allows a couple things. A, just like SCARA technology in the automotive industry, it can be programmed. So as that technology need changes for the next model of vehicle that's coming down the assembly line, that robot has to change and adapt. So it can be reprogrammed because it's software driven. So that's the advantage. It can stay updated and stay current at a moment's notice. Um, and it doesn't talk back, right? <laughs> so, so it's kind of nice that the, you know, SCARA technology has its positivities from the standpoint of, of being able to um, adapt quickly, adjust, modify, and make changes. And that's how we use it when it comes to opening up the, the interproximal space to provide consistency. In fact, I think your study, that was awesome. I don't know if you even highlighted this, is looking through your study, I found that, um, that when it came to opening up contacts, you found that it was just as successful as? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, staff person or? Probably, probably. The uh -huh. one limitation that we had in our study, uh, all our internal images were taken by our students. Okay. These are patients, patients come in and our students take radiographs. Uh, so they're learning and sometimes they make mistakes. So that uh, we did not um, use a radiology technologist or a dental assistant or a dental hygienist to take these intraoral images. Right. So the intraoral radiographs that we got may not have been the best. Okay. Uh, the extraoral technique that we used because the, uh, we had not implemented in our education at that time. So one of our technologists uh, was the one who operated the machine. Okay. Uh, she had more experience, uh, so probably that's one thing, and we mentioned in the paper uh, that this is one of our limitations. Uh, they're not exactly apple-to-apple -apple comparison. So every study has some limitation, and we, we mentioned that was one of the limitations. Can you disclose? One more thing that I'd like to add with the false positive. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see a uniform radiolucency next to a restoration, Uniform, a thin line, uh, radiolucency, a dark band, uh, that's probably an artifact on the new pan machines. Uh, if it's irregular radiolucency, that's probably a lesion. So what uh, the new machines do, they make the images very crisp. And while doing that, it creates a very distinct contrast from uh, one object to another. So you will see similar, very fine uh, uh, radiolucent line 
along with an implant. The whole, all around the implant is a very thin radiolucency. That's not disease. Uh, that's not uh, perimplantitis. That's an image artifact. Same with metal restorations. If you see uniform radiolucent line, black line, that's probably artifact. But if it's irregular, probably it's a lesion. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you brought that up um, because that's what we deal with in offices, assisting them, helping them with what they have and what they're looking at getting. And, um, you know, as far as like the raw image, I think you and I have talked about this before, um, about raw images and how they're not as crisp and clear. So basically it's the post-processing, not the actual yep. machine. So mm -hmm. the software creates what are called filters. So for example, if you have an intraoral x-ray and you're using a very popular software, they have buttons that clear views and things like that to make them sharpen. And what a filter is, just like a coffee filter, it does what? It removes things. So what it does is it looks for those um, gray scales that are falling in that area and the software then filters them out to make an image crisp and sharp so that you can see DEJ and you can see better contrast. Sadly, it's a filter. So it's removing data. Yes. So as it removes that data, so if you take your software when you get back to, to the office and you click sharpen and just keep on clicking, you'll replicate exactly what Dr. Ahmad's talking about. And it's not the machine performing that way necessarily. It's, it's the software, software post-processing. Yes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So be, yes, so be that's aware that I, I turned off all of those filters. Yeah. So I wanted every viewer to remember this uh, issue because if they have got a new machine and they'll say, I'm seeing too many carries these days. <laughs> and that's probably a lot of these are not carries. This is what the uh, software does to make the image look much better. So uh, right. the contrast goes up. Yep, yep. This is good information, I like it. So a um, few more questions. I know we're running way behind here. Um, and if anyone has to disconnect, the CE is over with. So we're just kind of having a great conversation with an expert that's willing to share his knowledge with us. This is great. Uh, let's see here. Um, video, long cone, reading. Um, yeah, I think you've addressed most of these. Um, the last one, was more of the 3D adjunct to 2D. Um, I don't know if you want to take a stab at that. I, they're basically asking um, how, how should they be moving forward with taking 3Ds. In this environment, they're saying extra orals preferred, but let's say COVID's gone and so, what that looks like. Uh, currently, don't use a CBCT for caries interpretation. No. Uh, I, uh, on my reports, I almost never mention about carious lesion unless it is very large. Mm -hmm. So uh, without radiography, if you can see a carious probably that shows up on a CBCT. So do not trust a CBCT for carious detection. Um, for any, uh, any lesion that requires a 3D understanding, a cyst or a benign tumor, a third molar extraction or a maxillary canine impaction, uh, those are benefited a lot with cross-sectional 3D images. Uh, we already mentioned about implants uh, in the webinar. Uh, our academy recommends that for any implant imaging, uh, you should take a CBCT scan. You start with an intraoral imaging and you go with a CBCT scan. And if you go to aaomr.org, you'll find that uh, position paper on implants. So that's the recommendation now. Uh, and there are other recommendations on endodontic uses. So endodontics are getting a lot of benefit using 3Ds. Uh, for most caries, uh, diagnosis intraoral images are still the best. That's the gold standard. Extraoral biting now with COVID-19, probably it will be used more. And then we may go back to intraoral imaging. I don't know because we have only that much data and the data is newer and it's changing. So currently for third molar extractions, maxillary canines, uh, cysts or benign tumors, all implants, uh, a 3D is a good tool. 
Um, I would like to uh, tell something that used to be an advertisement from a whiskey company like 30 years ago. It's called Shiva's Regal. Okay, Shiva's Regal was the whiskey and they had an ad that, of course, you can live without Shiva's Regal. The question is how well? <laughs> so, of course, you can live without 3D imaging. The question is how well? Oh, I love that. That's great. That's great. All right. You just gave me a marketing idea. Um, all right. So I think the last thing on that topic, and we can close this uh, morning off, is um, back to what Dr. Ludlow shared with the dental community. Um, you know, when we talked about radiation and all of that. Um, I think everybody's kind of agreed the debate of how much someone receives in the day is debatable. Um, whether it's eight to 10 microsieverts of radiation, what's a microsievert? Ah. Um, eight to 10 is what we normally get in a given day. It depends on if we're standing on our toes, if we're hanging out in Denver, wherever it is, right? Um, so the number eight to 10, so let's use the number nine. Dr. D John Ludlow uh, published um, single periapical. So a single periapical PA taken for obviously diagnostic purposes with a digital receptor, so a digital sensor, and a round collimator, which is the commonly used um, collimation inside of our industry, um, is nine microsieverts. So equal to one day's worth of radiation I see. So um, it, what's nice is, is companies are really doing the best they can to get that radiation level low. Because as you know, the AOMR, the AAE, the AAO, the ADA, the Image Gently, Image Wisely, all the organizations, you know, prefer the 2D method first and foremost because of radiation levels. But if we finally have found a way to get that radiation close to intraoral or less than, maybe we're looking at that paradigm shift we talked about earlier. So um, hopefully this is a good sign towards changing things in our industry yeah. and hopefully the AOMR will expand and, and research more and more on these technologies. Yeah, but still a um, vast majority of our clinical work is caries diagnosis in periodontal bone loss. Yeah. And that's where still intraoral imaging shines. Yeah. Uh, so 3D cannot replace our intraoral imaging. Uh, we uh, still dependent on that. Uh, there was one comment, uh, a private comment about um, patient positioning error on panoramic radiography and okay. was asking about if there was any link or something. So I posted on the uh, chat uh, to a web page that we use in our dental class. Oh, uh, great. Uh, about positioning error. It's incomplete. There is an uh, error on the word error in my <laughs> own web page, but at least it will uh, help you. Panoramic is very prone to uh, uh, positioning errors. Uh, so that page has six panoramic images, uh, and maybe it will help a few people on how to position and uh, detect what went wrong when. Exactly. Yeah. No, we appreciate that. That's yeah. very nice. Appreciate that. So I think that's all the questions that I'm seeing on here. Um, let's just make sure our moderator doesn't have any other questions that may have come through as I was answering those. Um, I think we are all set. I hate to say goodbye. I hope we can continue this conversation some other time. Um, you're, you're fascinating. Um, to talk to, I, I, I will tell you in all honesty, radiation, like I said, is the hottest topic right now along with this with COVID. So now we've got the marriage of these two important things and I think um, your light is It's over and I'd recommend you to watch a movie. The movie was about to be released sometime in March, but I think they delayed it. Uh, the movie is called Radium Girls. Mm -hmm. So this was in, you can still see a, uh, the trailer in YouTube, Radium Girls. These were girls in Connecticut, in uh, New Jersey and Chicago, who used to paint watch dials with a paintbrush on a watch dial. And they used to lick the brush to uh, make it pointed. So they ended up with a lot of osteosarcoma cases. And initially the companies refused to accept that yeah, the radium was harmful. Uh, this was about 100 years ago. 
Uh, we are still probably making some mistakes. Uh, so we have to be careful with radiation. The dose have come down, but it's not zero. So any radiation has a risk of uh, detrimental effects like cancer. So we have to be uh, careful about that. Well, you probably might not know this. Um, maybe you do as the president of the AOMR, but um, I was um, vetted by uh, Dr. Bob Langley to be an associate for the AOMR. And um, I won't disclose who I spoke to, but it was very similar to that of um, the one thing we know about radiation, there's no such thing as good radiation. That's really the only thing we can all kind of agree on. Uh. <laughs> Not yet necessarily. All right. We have a new president in town. All right. I love it. There are some people, they call it radiation hormesis. Right. Which uh, they say that some radiation is good because we are living in a cloud of radiation all the time. Right. Uh, right now, we are getting some radiation from our background. So I think our body is made up to have some radiation around it. And if we take our body outside radiation completely, probably will not function. Right. So some radiation is probably good, uh, but the radiation hormesis is not very acceptable to most uh, radiation biologists. So right. we should consider that any uh, man-made radiation is not a good thing. That's what they meant. Yeah. I stand correct. They were replying that yeah, they were not implying that the sun is bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that life is bad. So <laughs> no, that that that's awesome. One other question did pop up. Um, the the um, our moderator um, Don had uh, posted here, and obviously this is a CE lecture. Um, we're not here to promote any particular products whatsoever. So hopefully everyone respects that. But now that the CE CE is over. Um, they are asking, um, should they plan on getting a machine? And absolutely. I mean, doctor, what, what, what did you say? What was that line about you can practice without something or? I didn't say anything. This was a whiskey ad. <laughs> oh, the whiskey ad. Yeah, okay. Zip. All right, so the whiskey <laughs> ad. Was, said, uh, right. So, so doctor, I live, think. What, she was regal. The question is how well. Right, I don't right. drink alcohol at all. So I don't know you because I'm living well. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I tell you what, this COVID thing's got me off from it because, you know, you sit around here and you do that sort of stuff. It adds the belly weight, right? So that ain't happening in my household right now. Um, so no, um, in all seriousness, uh, the, um, the, I'm assuming it's a, a dentist, possibly, I can't tell, but they're asking, um, it looks like it could be Dr. Catherine here. Um, about getting a machine. Love, love to have a Plan Mecca rep talk to you. Um, if I can give you any words of encouragement, and I'm going to do this from a product expert standpoint, not with my Plan Mecca hat on, but I would tell you just be informed. Um, look for things that can grow with your needs. So as your practice grows, you have a technology that can grow that's not obsolete tomorrow. And um, look for things that make it easy for your staff, right? So we talked about the different imaging styles. So if the machine can um, automatically focus and just take the pan for the staff and they hold a button down that's that's nice um, targeting lights can be challenging so those are things you want to look for can you take these bite wings that's a nice thing can you upgrade it to 3d um, can the things you know handle the problems of you know if it's a 3d machine with motion of patients and things like that so just just be informed do your due diligence let us help you we will guide you and um, if you shop around and want to look at other products, we welcome that um, because the more informed you are, the better choice you make for your patients in the end. So um, thank you for that question. And I think we're all set. Let's uh, get you back to seeing students. All right. Thank Educate you so much. Educate the next generation for us. Sure, sure. All right. Thank you, you take care. Thanks, Bye, everyone, everybody. for uh, coming to this webinar. Yes. Thank you for your time during the day. Thank you.